Hello and welcome to Seven Church. I'm Pastor Jeremy and I'm so glad you're tuning in online. We're absolutely a church that believes in no perfect people allowed. We're starting a brand new series called Fresh where we're looking at the fruits of the Spirit and how we can grow our faith every single day. Matter of fact, it's why we call it Seven. We're helping people find and follow Jesus seven days a week. And as we tackle this series over the course of the summer, we're gonna be looking at how do we grow in these areas of our faith development including all the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5, 22 and 23, where it talks about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. All of those we're going to learn how to grow in those areas over the course of this summer. Thanks for joining us. How are we doing, church? Good to see you all, and make sure you have notes. I got some stuff I want you to write down. If you have a Bible, turn to uh, James chapter 3, and then I want to let you know a couple things that are going on. One is September 13th is our membership dinner, and that's uh, just a time for you to check it out, see if you might want to become a member. You're going to hear more about us, where we're going, some of the future plans that are out there, uh, and then we'll feed you a nice dinner as well. So, Make sure to uh, write down on the connection card. There's a box there. It says, I'm interested in the membership dinner. We just need to know how much filet mignon and all the other kind of steak that we have. So we just want to know um, uh, so we don't, you know, we have enough food. All right, that's coming up September 13th. And again, there's no obligation in terms of signing up that night. It's just a chance to check us out. You can ask questions or get answers, all that good stuff. Okay, and I also wanted us to give it up for our band because our band rocks it out. And I don't know if you heard what Cameron said, but that song, they wrote that song Monday. And yeah, that last song, that was so phenomenal. Just a great song, my new favorite song. So really, really excited about it. And yes, they will be putting a CD together at some point. Right, Cameron, in the back there? Come on, baby. So we can play that in the car. We can hear it all the time. That's what I'm talking about. I want to welcome our online church community as well. And I want to welcome everybody watching outside and in the cafe. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to be in James chapter 3, as I mentioned, as we continue in this series that we called Fresh Elements of a Healthy Life. We're looking through the nine fruits of the Spirit over the course of this series. Okay, we've talked about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control is today. What does it look like to have self-control and what does that mean as a Christian, someone who is trying to live a life for Jesus Christ? What does that really mean? How do we have self-control? So we're going to look at that and there are many things that you can control. You can control your mood, your money, your schedule. We want to look at how do I actually control my mouth? Everyone's like, oh, man, how do I get out of here? (laughs) Anything uncontrolled, you know, where you lose your self-control can harm your relationships, obviously. And and there's several things the Bible talks about. It talks about uncontrolled anger, uncontrolled lust, uncontrolled spending, uncontrolled drinking, uncontrolled ambition. Any of those things can harm your relationships. Anything out of control like that. Now, I don't have time today to talk about all of those things, so I'm going to focus on the one that does the most damage of all of them, and that's an uncontrolled mouth. And so I want you to write that down. The greatest destroyer, the one we're going to focus on, is an uncontrolled mouth. James chapter 3, verse 2 says it like this. If anyone can control his tongue, it proves he has perfect control over himself. I'm going to read this whole section. 3, 1 through 12. Here it goes. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers and sisters. He says, when you're a teacher, a teacher of God's word, you're held to a higher standard of how you use your mouth. So it's really important, he says, be careful. Because you know those who, judge will be, those who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. He doesn't deny that we all blow it. We all make mistakes. Uh, those who are never at fault in what they say are perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large, driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder, 
wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. It's like, geez, James, what do you really mean? (laughs) All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by human beings, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With a tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Now, the context is that James, he was the half-brother of Jesus, and he did not believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. After the resurrection, he sees his brother. He's like, whoa, everything you said is actually true. I can't believe it, but now I do believe it. And he became a strong follower of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he ended up being martyred for Christ. All right. So I think when I'm reading this, and he's illustrating this about the tongue and everything, he experienced it. He probably said some awful things about his brother. He probably said some horrible things. And he realized, oh, this, I need to write this down for the churches so they understand how important this is. Now, we all love to talk. People love to talk. Talk shows are on 24 hours a day. Radio, TV, internet, podcasts, right? It's, It's everywhere. As a matter of fact, you'll probably have, now on average... About 30 conversations today. About 30 conversations is the average per day. As a matter of fact, if you live to be 100 years old, one-fifth of your life will be spent talking. That's 20 years. Think about that. Can you imagine just starting right now and taking 20 years and just talking nonstop? That's that's how many words we use. 20 years. That's a lot of talking. And because we use so many words, we get ourselves into trouble. How many here have ever gotten themselves in trouble with their words? Go ahead. Raise them. Yeah. Look around, right? That's why we're here. Glad you're here. Glad you're watching online everywhere else because we need this. We need, uh, for some of you, it's a reminder. You're like, oh, I've been letting it slip a little bit. Others of you, you've never heard this before. Uh, this, is, this is great to, to, to grasp this. All right? and James wrote this in A.D. 49. 49 A.D. was when he wrote this about our mouths, and it is still applicable today. So uh, first, I'm going to talk about why self-control over your mouth is so important, and then I'm going to show you how to do it. So why, and then the how. Number one reason Because it's important, three things. Number one, what I say determines where I go in life. What I say, the words I use determines where I go in this life. Sets the direction. James gives a couple illustrations. One is in verse 3. And he says in verse 3, we can make a large horse turn around and go wherever we want by means of a small bit in his mouth. Think about this, right? A horse. We know this in Lakeside. Horses everywhere. All right? You can put a small bit, you put it under the tongue of the horse. A a kid can do this and steer a 2,000-pound animal anywhere, all right, just by having a bit in its mouth. Think about that. This is what James is saying. It's the same thing. Our tongue is very small, but yet how we use it actually steers the direction of our life just by the way we use our tongue, the way we use our mouth. It, if we use it positively, we're going to go in that direction. If we use it negatively, we're going to go in that direction. He says, the way you use your tongue absolutely matters. We direct it. By the way, this is a terrible day to have a message on taming the tongue and the mouth because I'm going to be in the dunk tank and I'm going to talk a lot of trash today. I just want you to know that. <laughs> I want you to know that. Okay, It's right out here. And I'm going to be blasting you left and right to try to distract you 
from hitting the target with the ball, okay? And I will be making a lot of fun of you, but it's in good love. I just want you to know that. It's because I love you, all right? And I don't want you to get me wet. But, (laughs) all right, verse 4, it says, Or take ships as an example, although they are so large and they're driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Huge ships. Think about our harbor here in San Diego. We're a military town, Navy, right? We got Navy ships everywhere. We got the Midway. Then we've got these other aircraft carriers, which are humongous. And yet, I mean, there's 6,000 people on some of these ships. I mean, it's incredible, right? But yet, relative to the size of that humongous ship is a very small rudder that actually steers it. He says that's the same thing. He just overemphasizes this part of it, that we have these tiny little tongues, <laughs> and yet, man, they steer our life. They steer the big picture of our life, what we say, how we use it. Your tongue is the rudder of your life. It's the guidance system of your life. It's the steering wheel of your life because the tongue is such a small part of our body, we tend to forget its importance, but it's actually a controlling factor in your life. It controls where you're going, and what you're doing in this life. You know, uh, Roger Bannister was uh, the first man to ever run a mile under four minutes, okay? For years and years leading up to this, people said it was impossible. Can't do it. Impossible. Physiologists, doctors, all these people said, you know what would happen if someone actually ran that fast for that long Their heart would explode. So they said, it can't do it. Not going to happen. Roger Bannister in 1954 ran a mile in 3 minutes, 59 seconds, 0.4. Shattered the, the myth. He was asked, how did you do it? He said, I told myself I could. I told myself I could. When everyone else was saying it's not going to happen, so nobody broke through the barrier... Nobody did it. They couldn't. It couldn't. And everybody accepted it. It's not going to happen. Roger Bannister said, I'm going to do it. I can do it. See, what? What happened? His mouth, what he said, set the direction of his life. And it's interesting, isn't it, that after that, two months later, another guy ran a mile in under four minutes. After that, another and another. It just, many people have done it now. But their hearts haven't exploded. He didn't believe that nonsense. He said, you know what? I believe it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to say it. It sets the direction of my life. You have no idea how powerful your words are because we don't realize how strongly they do set the direction of our life. A lot of you got to stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. All right? Positivity. You got to have it. It's clear in the Bible that it's a good thing to talk good words to others and to ourselves. Okay? If you want to know where you're headed in the future, just look at your conversation. Listening to some of the things you're saying. Uh, That's where you're headed. Do you talk about the Lord the most? Do you talk about money the most? Do you talk about problems the most? Whatever you're focusing on, your rudder is steering in that direction. Whatever your conversation is, whatever dominates your conversation, that's where you're headed. So it's very important to use your words wisely. Look at Proverbs 13.3. It says it like this. Those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. <laughs> You've got to love the Word of God. It just says it like it is, right? Opening your mouth can just ruin it all. So, I want to be really clear. If you want to get control of your life, get control of your conversation. It's huge to understand. How you talk to yourself and how you talk to others. Secondly, what I say can destroy what I have. What I say can destroy what I have. And he gives us another clear picture of this. He says in verse 5 and 6, The tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. That's like amen, right? Yes, we know this. A great forest can be set on fire by one tiny spark, and the tongue is a flame of fire. 
Now, we all remember the big fires we've had here in San Diego. I think it was 07, 08 when we had the Cedar Fire, Witch Creek Fire. We had, it seemed like all of San Diego was on fire at one point. And you remember how that started was there was a, a camper who, who got lost, a hiker who got lost and decided to light a fire to be noticed, to get help, right? That tiny little spark took off and about burned down all of San Diego's, as we remember. And James tells us that, yeah, it's, that's all it takes. Just like a forest fire can be started with a little spark, he says, <laughs> your whole life can be changed by that little spark, that little thing that you say that you think is not a big deal, but you say it, and it catches fire. And many of you have experienced that, right? You've experienced that. And and some of you have felt that uh, on the other side of it. Someone has said something to you, maybe as a kid, a coach, maybe a teacher, a parent said something to you, and today you still remember it. It was a negative. It was something they said about you personally, and that still kind of goes around in your, in your head, and sometimes it pops up in your mind. You ever met a verbal arsonist? You know what a verbal arsonist is? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Those people that love to spread gossip. They love to say something, and they just kind of throw it out there. Sometimes they go, hey, did you hear about... It's like a little flame. And they're hoping you got a can of gasoline, right? They're like... And then you pour it on, it goes... And then they go over here and they say to somebody else, and they're, and they're just verbal arson. It's just coming out. It's a spark. Hoping it catches. Verbal arsonists, man, they do so much damage. Don't be a verbal arsonist. They're always using inflammatory words, and nothing spreads faster in fire uh, than fire except gossip spreads faster. James 3 6, the tongue, look what it says. The tongue is set on fire by hell itself. And can turn our whole lives into a blazing flame of destruction and disaster. I mean, he just comes right out. (laughs) He says, look at that. The tongue is set on fire by hell itself. He says, when we're we're being gossips or when we're saying things we shouldn't be saying, he's saying, that's coming from hell. (laughs) That's coming from the pit. He goes, don't do it. Because fire out of control is so devastating. But words under control are encouraging. It's the same illustration with fire. If you have fire under control, it's good, right? It warms us cooks for us. It's encouraging. Um, Fire out of control is devastating. Words out of control are devastating. My words steer the direction of my life. It says it's set on fire by hell itself. Man. I mean, you heard people say, she said this, then he said that, then all hell broke loose. That's that idea right there. And that's what happens, isn't it? Just gets out of control. So what's the antidote? Proverbs 21, 23. Look what it says. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Keep your mouth closed. And you'll stay out of trouble. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> now, it's hard to have foot, foot and mouth disease when it's closed, okay? Just keep it closed. Verse 7 and 8, James gives us an illustration from nature. All kinds of animals have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Humanly speaking, the tongue just seems to be uncontrollable. And I love this illustration because here we are in San Diego. We have the San Diego Zoo. We got SeaWorld. Um, and we've tamed all kinds of animals. We got killer whales. We've got all these, right? We've got huge lions and giraffes at the zoo and all in gigantic silverback gorillas. Tamed them all. But he says, why can't man tame the tongue? We can tame all these animals, but we're having trouble taming the tongue. He says, it's a restless. It's restless and it's full of deadly poison. In your notes, Sarah, I would love for you to circle restless and circle poison. Those are a couple of very important words. As I've mentioned to you before, James, this book was written originally in the New Testament in Greek. And so here's the Greek word for restless. Akatastatos. <laughs> Aren't you glad it's in English now? <laughs> right? And this is what it means. It means it could attack at any moment. He says, the tongue is so restless, it can attack at any moment. And he says, so you got to be, that was purposeful. (laughs) It's got to, it it could absolutely attack at any moment. And and I love this illustration. Someone sent me this, uh, I think it was YouTube or Twitter, I can't remember, but it was a little little video. And it was a snake charmer. And the dude, you've probably seen this, the dude was charming, you know, a a, a cobra. 
And he's like, do-do-do, do whatever they do. I don't think he actually says do-do-do, but you know what I mean? He's like, <laughs> he's doing all this stuff with it. And the thing, you know, is doing its thing, and it's got its... <laughs> and uh, this person that's in the crowd says, is that a cobra? And the guy turns and goes, yeah, like, yeah, you idiot. And it, <laughs> and it bit him. It bit him right in the arm. Died on the spot. No, I'm just kidding. He didn't die. But... Um, <laughs> But he was fine. The video went on to say he was fine. I guess he probably had some anti-venom in his pocket. I don't know. But he was fine. But it's just fascinating to think you turn your attention for a moment and the snake can bite. If we don't think about our words, if we don't actually control our words, it's restless. Our tongue can get restless and we can, we can bite in a second, can't we? We just... Mm. One moment. He says, I love how he says that. It's restless. It's full of deadly poison. Poison, the Greek word there is ios, and that literally means snake venom. It says our words, when we're using these nasty words, he says it's like snake venom. You can throw it out there. You can bite somebody, ask for forgiveness, but the venom still has to work through the system, doesn't it? It takes a long time. It takes a long time. Those words are out there. It's, it's really, really difficult. Still stings. Some of you still remember those words that were said to you a long time ago. And it still stings today because that venom is painful. Here's a third reason. I want you to write this down. What I say puts on display who I really am. What I say puts on display who I really am. If you want to know what a person's really like, look at their words. Look at how they talk. Look at their conversation. It is a mirror of what's going on in the inside. One of the things our words reveal is our inconsistencies. Look at verse 10. He tells us, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, and this should not be. So he tells us there's this inconsistency going on in our life. And when he talks about cursing here, he's not talking necessarily about, you know, swearing and, and, and cussing. He's talking about negative words. He's talking about words that tear people down. That's what he's talking about right there. Most of you, you don't have a problem with cussing. Like, that's something you've gotten over a long time. Well, I say most of you because there's a group right back here I watched a Charger game with recently. And they're, <laughs> they're out of control. But, no, I'm just kidding. But, you know, it's... It's not, it's not not normally a problem for you, but it might be your biting remarks. It might be the remarks that you use sarcastically that you tear people down with. And this is what he's talking about. And then he says, you, you have your devotional time, or you come to church, you praise God. And he goes, no, 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 that shouldn't be. He says, that's not the way it should be. In verse 12, he explains it. He goes, look, here's the deal. He says in verse 12, can you pick olives from a fig tree... Obviously, no, you're going to get figs from a fig tree. Or can you get figs from a grapevine? No, you're going to get grapes from a grapevine. He says, no. And you can't get fresh water from a salty pool. And so he says, it's none of that. He goes, look, you, you, if you've got a problem, it's a problem with your tongue, consider the source that it is coming from. The nature of the tree produces that kind of fruit. And so here's his bottom line. He says, the problem is my heart. It's my nature. It's what's on the inside of me that is the problem. Listen to what Jesus says about our mouths. He says, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, the issue is really right there. It's my heart. My mouth reveals what's really going on in my heart. I may trick you for a while. I may be able to fake it. But eventually, my heart reveals the truth. It comes out and it overflows. And here's the problem with that. We can't get it back. See, this is the idea that I want you to be left with so you can see this. It's like trying to put toothpaste back in the tube. You know what I'm saying? It's like... When you say something negative, hurtful, biting, cursing, it's like this. Blah, 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 blah. Right? That's what you just did. And then it's like, oh, I can't believe I said that. That's not me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
man, that's my bad. I really apologize. No, I really mean it. I really mean it. I am so sorry. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, right? So this is what James is saying. You just have to be so careful with what you say and with your words, right? I mean, that's Philip, right? You shake my hand. I'm just kidding. You would do it. <laughs> that's the thing he's trying to get to is, look, even though we'll say sorry, even though we'll say, man, my bad, it was a bad moment, and we can all go, okay, you know, hey, everybody makes mistakes, yeah. All of that, and that's true, and all that's true and important, but it's still there, isn't it? It's hard to get it back in there. Matter of fact, it's impossible to get it back in there. And so, you know, it's one of those things. <laughs> it's just one of those things that you got you to deal with, man. You can't get it back in there, all right? And we got to ask God. <laughs> I'm gross you out. Some of you are like, you don't know what toothpaste is. All right, what are you talking about? It's toothpaste. That's what it is. <laughs> Someone told me yesterday, earlier, another service, they said, you know, the uh, toothbrush was invented in Lakeside, right? You ever heard that one? All right, otherwise it would have been called the, the teeth brush. <laughs> Some of you will get that after the burger. You, you, yeah. I'm just like, I can say that because I grew up here. All right, so it's all good. What's the solution? What's the solution? This is what I want you to write down. How do we actually do this? Because it's great to know all these things that happen when we, our words get out of trouble. How do I fix it? How do I go about it? Number one, this is the most important is, is man, I just got to get a new heart from God. Remember? It's an issue of the heart. It's all about the nature of the tree. It's the nature inside me. That's what it is. It's me. And so I need to take and ask God to take my heart of bitterness, to take my heart of anger, to take my heart that, you know what, I feel like I got a raw deal. Uh, take my heart that I feel like I shouldn't have been let go from this job or I shouldn't have, my wife or husband shouldn't have done that to me or my parents when I was growing up. Uh, shouldn't have done this or that. I need to ask God to take that heart that's full of bitterness, anger, uh, maybe some guilt and shame that's in there, and God, replace it. Replace it with your heart of peace, your heart of comfort, your heart of purpose in my life. Get a new heart. Look what it says in Ezekiel, the Old Testament, talking about it. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. And God specializes in heart transplants. He changes you from the inside out. See, it's no good to just paint the house if the foundation is cracked and crumbling. Eventually, it's coming down. So we got to change it in here. That's where it starts. You just tell him, God, I need you to work in my life. And look what he promises in 2 Corinthians 5.17. When anyone becomes a Christian, he or she becomes a brand new person inside. He is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. So, ask him for a heart transplant. Secondly, pause before I push. We all know how to push buttons in people's lives that are close to us. We all know that person at work. We all know that person at home. We all know that person in our neighborhood. We know how to push their button. And before you do that, God says, pause. Take a moment, okay? Take a deep breath. Um, for those of you that love to lash out on social media or through text message, whew, wait, just wait, pause. Maybe you write it out, get it out, and then put it in a saved place. Save it on your notes or save it on your email drafts. Don't, res don't react. You want to take time to respond. Don't just Bruh! pause before you push that button. You may think you have a great comeback in that moment. You're like, oh, I'm going to get them. They said that. Ooh. And you just pile it on. Well, guess what's coming back? Something worse than that first one. You go, oh, yeah? And then, boom. It goes like that. And then all you're doing is escalating the situation. Nobody wins. Nobody wins. Just pause. If you just take a deep breath and do what James says, look what he says. Everyone should be quick to listen. And then what? Slow to speak, yes, and slow to become angry. If we're slow to speak, we'll be much more likely to be slow to become angry. Just pause, just pause. And then lastly, pray for help daily. Pray for help daily. 
And I just put this in here because this is a good prayer to pray. It's Psalm 141 in verse 3. It says, Lord, help me control my tongue. Help me be careful about what I say. I think we can use that. <laughs> it's a great verse to pray daily. Lord, help me. Help me be careful with what I say. Now, the reality is we all need God's help to break lifelong habits. Some of you have been taught certain ways to speak since you're kids. You've always done it. Both a bit in a horse's mouth and a rudder on a ship are useless if the one controlling it doesn't know how to use it and doesn't know where to go. That's why you need Jesus Christ as the captain of your ship. You need Jesus Christ guiding you, directing you, leading you. He'll take you to the right place. He's not going to let you go the wrong way. You give over that control and you say, you got it, Lord. And every day you do that because every day we all do this. We try to take back the wheel. <laughs> don't we? We say, here you go, Lord. Woo! Ooh, a couple things happen. I don't like them. Take back the wheel. Sorry, Jesus. All right? No. What we have to do is say, yours. It's yours. I'm following you. I trust you. You're the, the captain of my ship. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And when God wants to make a change with us, he starts on the inside. And that's why we sang that song earlier, From the Inside Out. Because it starts on the inside. It's not on the outside. So what we're talking about is going from the heart outward. It's either going to be you leading or Jesus leading. And he knows more about your life than you do. Let's put our trust in him. He'll stir our ship exactly where we need to go. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us, for guiding us, for directing us. And I just want to encourage you as you're sitting there in the silence of your heart, say to Jesus, just tell him I want you to be the leader of my life. You call the shots. Help me with the things that I need help with. Guide me, direct me. I just want to ask you three questions as you're sitting there. One is what direction? You can just answer them in your own head. What direction is your mouth leading you today? Is it leading you down the pathway of conflict and bitterness? I mean, what do you talk about the most? Because that's the direction you're headed. Secondly, what are you destroying with careless words? Or maybe who are you destroying with careless words? Maybe as a result of today, you got to go and ask forgiveness from some people. And just say, look, I'm sorry for the things that I've said. I'm sorry for how I've hurt you uh, in the past. Maybe it's to some kids. Maybe your husband, maybe your wife. Maybe a neighbor. Three, what, what do your words reveal about you? What kind of heart do you have? Maybe you just say to the Father, Father, I need your help in this area. Help me with my tongue. Help me with my mouth. Help me with my life. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. If you're here and you would like someone to pray with you, please come forward at the end of the service. Our prayer team would love to pray with you. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Put your hands together.